Hey guys, welcome back. Today is our last lesson for our logic unit. So, and luckily it's it's pretty straightforward and should be pretty easy. So I'm gonna try to go through it pretty quick, um, give you guys a little bit of a break. Tomorrow we're gonna do our practice test for uh, the logic unit. And when we come back on Monday, I'll analyze the results from the practice solutions. Uh, I'll probably post the practice solutions on, on Saturday so you can look, or maybe you'll get, even get it up on Friday, just depending, depending on how I feel. Um, but anyway, then you can, you can see how you did. Then we'll do a review on Monday, and then on Tuesday we'll take the test for logic. Then we'll move on to our last unit we're going to take before we, the last unit we do uh, virtually before we come back after fall break, which will be parallel and perpendicular lines, um, and mainly parallel lines and angle pair relationships within them. But that's actually a pretty simple unit, I think, as well. So uh, if you guys aren't happy where your grades are right now, keep in mind um, I will put all the grades in for unit two on Tuesday when I put in the test scores on Tuesday as well. So that's going to bring your grade up quite a bit. Um, yeah, and so just make sure you're caught up on your homework and do your best. Make sure you're taking the practice test. Some of you guys didn't even take it last time or you rushed through it or you didn't look at the solution. So uh, the practice test, and whenever I go over the solutions for practice test, I'm, I'm really telling you how to do the test. So really pay attention. Make sure you study that uh, as best you can and make sure you understand these concepts and make sure you're actually doing your homework and stuff like that. But uh, shouldn't be too worried about your grades. Most of you guys are doing really well, um, and I'm, I'm happy. You guys are happy, and things are going great. So... I uh, can't, can't wait to see you guys in person and to continue uh, doing, doing some of the videos as well. It'll be kind of, kind of interesting. So uh, it's going to be a good year. Um, and yeah, so let's go ahead and get right into it without any further ado. So on just our quick review here, we have a conditional statement saying that if P then Q, or in other words, P implies Q is another way we read that. So if it's an odd number, then that means it's not divisible by two. So what they're saying is that odd numbers are a subset of the numbers that are not divisible by two, meaning it lives entirely inside that subset. So the conditional statement is true. Then we can look at the converse of the statement. So if we switch the order of those, is it still true? So now Q implies P, so if Q, then P. In other words, if it's not divisible by two, does it mean that it has to be an odd number? Um, yes. So not divisible by two and odd, so all we do is switch the order of those two. Now if both of these statements are true, if it's reversible in other words, meaning if odd numbers are not divisible by two and things that are not divisible by two are odd, then the only way it's possible that they can be subsets of each other is if they're actually an improper subset, meaning that it's the exact same set of numbers. Meaning every number that exists, or any element of the set, <laughs> It sounds so fun to say because that's like real like mathematical lingo but any element of the set that's an odd number is also divisible not divisible by two and any element that's a not divisible by two is also an odd number meaning they make up the same set of elements uh, that are odd numbers and not divisible by two so what we'd say is this is biconditional because it has two conditions going both directions the conditional and the converse going from p to q and then back from q to p so we show it with the symbols of having the arrows going both directions and we write it out as P if and only if Q. So we're saying P happens if Q happens, and P happens only if Q happens. So it actually is allowing it to go both directions, which is kind of cool uh, in the English language. Um, all right, so when this is true, when we, <coughs> excuse me, when we have biconditional uh, statements and it's true going both directions and it's biconditional, we say it's reversible and it's also a definition. So uh, we can define odd numbers as numbers that are not divisible by two. And we can define numbers that are not divisible by two by odd numbers. So pretty cool, good stuff. Ooh, that's kind of odd. I wonder if those are actually animated like they're supposed to be. I don't want to start over. Eh, I'm just going to go into it. All right, so today we're going to talk about deduction and induction, the law of detachment and the law of syllogism. So first we have deduction. So deduction has been around for a very, very long time. Um, and one of the people that studied it was Rene Descartes. Uh, you might recognize the Descartes as in uh, the Cartesian plane, which is um, your X and Y uh, coordinates for like um, plotting out points. So that in most of algebra, I believe they called Rene Descartes the um, the father of algebra, even though Al Khwarizmi, uh, who was an Arabic mathematician, came up with a lot of algebra, but uh, Rene Descartes kind of uh, kind of gave us what we have modern algebra today with variables like x and y and stuff like that. That uh, is is credited to Rene Descartes. All right, so uh, we start out with premises. So with deduction, we have a premise, like um, a famous one from him was everything that thinks exists. So if it's capable of thinking, then it must clearly exist. So we could write that out as a conditional statement uh, and symbols thinking, therefore existing. And so I think, um, so if everything that thinks exists, and if I am capable of thinking, then what do we know? 
that means that I must exist. And so this is this is kind of silly, um, honestly, but deduction can seem kind of obvious. And this is also called the law of uh, detachment. So uh, this is where the famous phrase comes from, where it says, I think, therefore I am. So it's essentially what he was getting at. So I, I think, I'm capable of thinking, th so therefore I must exist. So apparently Rene Descartes, whenever he wasn't uh, coming up with modern modern type algebra stuff, and not modern algebra, that's different, but uh, whenever he was coming up with with other math things, he uh, thought about whether or not he existed, and he came up with the idea, well, everything that that thinks must exist, and I'm thinking, so therefore I must exist, and that was it. So anyway, uh, kind of silly. So that's deduction. Induction instead is based on observations. So let's say uh, let's say that you you all the chickens that you ever see look like this, and they're all red. Then you might conclude, I think these chickens are from like Rhode Island or something like that. But anyway, you can look them if, uh, look them up if you want. But let's say you live in Rhode Island, all the chickens that you see in Rhode Island, they're all red. So you might conclude that all chickens must be red. Okay, well then you travel a little bit and you run across this chicken over here. Um, maybe you go to another state and they have white chickens. And so now your original, uh, your original uh, theory about all chickens being red, well, now you got to revisit it because uh, before it was true because that's all that you ever knew, but now you found a white chicken. So now you must revisit it and you say, okay, so now all chickens are either red or they're white. Okay, fine. That's it. All right. Well, you'd be wrong because uh, in, uh, I think it was Indonesia or Malaysia, Malaysia, oh, they're right next to each other. Anyway, in Malaysia, they have uh, chickens with hyperpigmentism, which is sounds exactly what you might think. Think about pigment. Uh, yes. There are black chickens. <laughs> so this is a gothic chicken. All right. So it has hyperpigmentism, and basically the the pigment in its uh, in its in its skin and its feathers and its eyeball and its beak is all uh, hyperpigmentism. There's just crazy amount of pigment, and so it, it's a black chicken. And what's crazy about these chickens? They're considered a delicacy um, in in Asia, but and I, and when I was in China, I never I never saw a black chicken, but the meat itself is also black. It's kind of a dark blue, but it kind of looks black. So anyway, a gothic chicken. Somebody, I think, photoshopped that ring on it because that's not real. But anyway, so it's out there. So now our original uh, our original theory of all chickens are red, and then we had to change it all chickens are red or white. Now we have to say, okay, all chickens are either red, they're white, or they're black or gothic, right? Okay. Uh, and so we notice with induction, it's it's based on our observation. It's limited to things that we can observe, and it's also not always correct. So um, up until uh, certain discoveries or things are, you know, our theories are always changing, right? So um, we've had several explanations of like how the world has come about. You know, now the current one's Big Bang, but before the Big Bang, there were several other explanations, like hundreds of different explanations, and then they kind of keep changing. So just like, oh well, now we no longer believe that. Now we believe this or something else which is kind of funny because uh, there's been one story that I believe, and that's been true since the Jews, very, very long, long time ago. So anyway, and, and many other people groups also believe the exact same uh, creation story, which is kind of cool. So induction is limited to what we can observe, right? And sometimes it's wrong. Um, until we discover other things, we didn't realize that we were wrong before, just like science is constantly evolving. And if we look at scientific things that we used to think, we would make fun of them now to this day, uh, even though some of you guys apparently still believe the world is flat. What's wrong with you? And by the way, don't eat Tide Pods, they'll kill you. So, you know, public service announcement, all that good stuff. Anyway, what you're probably saying is, Mr. Murphy, I don't know what you're talking about. Chickens don't look like that or that. Definitely am seeing chicken like that. Chicken looks like that. <laughs> so, yes, all chicken is uh, Kane's chicken fingers. Oh, that makes me really hungry. Anyway, that looks so good. And it's golden, crispy, brown, and awesome. All right, I'm going to move on. <laughs> Again, me laughing at my only jokes. And uh, Madeline's dog thinks I'm funny. So, you know, I got something going for me. All right. Um, deduction versus induction. So deduction popularized by Aristotle back in B BC, very, very long time ago. Uh, induction kind of came about with Sir Francis Bacon, uh, who kind of started, I believe, like the scientific... Um, scientific revolution and stuff like that so that's kind of kind of what kicked the whole thing off or was a big part of scientific revolution is they're saying hey look we don't have to just focus on premises which are limited to truths or statements that we are like absolute truths and other stuff uh, and and when we use deduction that logic if, as long as our premises are true the deduction will always be true and so it, it's very nice very clean very pristine and and 
It's a very popular form of logic for a long, long time. But then um, with the scientific revolution, uh, comes around with Sir Francis Bacon and other contemporaries. It's like, look, we can do this thing called science, which is based on repeated observations. Um, it's limited to things that we can observe, right? Um, and it's only sometimes true. So unfortunately, it's as good as we can do up to that point. But then later on, we end up looking back at our science. And we're like, wow, we were dumb. But we're still dumb. Anyway, yes. Law of detachment. So law of detachment is really, really simple. It's a form of, of deduction. So all humans make mistakes. That's our premise. So if this statement, we're assuming it's true, all humans make mistakes, except that one guy. Anyway, Henry is a human, right? So therefore, Henry will make mistakes. So if our premise is true, and then we have this hypothesis that Henry is a human and all humans make mistakes, then we can claim that Henry will make mistakes. That is the law of detachment. So if P is true, means Q is true, and we, tell, we know that Henry is P, so then Henry also must be Q. Q must happen as well. Law of detachment. Let's do another example. If you arrive at the theater by 2 o'clock, then you can see the show. Julie arrives at the theater at 1.45 meaning she arrived by 2 o'clock, before 2 o'clock. So what can we conclude? That Julie will, she can see the show, right? Because she arrived before 2 o'clock. So our deduction, our, our law of detachment says that if you arrive before 2 o'clock, you'll be able to see the show. She gets there before 2 o'clock, so what can we say? We can state that she was able to see the show. Here's another one. All right, if you swim 100 meters in less than 90 seconds, then you will make it onto the swim team. Jeremy swam the 200 meters in 180 seconds. So we need to know what did he swim the 100 meters in. That was the test to be able to make it on swim team. But Jeremy didn't swim 100 meters, he swam 200 meters. So can we conclude or can we infer how fast he would be able to swim 100 meters? No. So unfortunately, the there's no conclusion on this one because this does not match, our hypothesis does not match our premise exactly. Uh, we can't make a conclusion. We don't know how fast he swims 100 meters. Uh, you would assume he could swim it faster than half the time he could do 200 meters in, which would be less, uh, which would be about 95 seconds. Uh, so hopefully he could, you know, we, we just don't know. Uh, we can't make that inference. So until we know how fast he swims 100 meters, we can't use anything with the law of detachment. All right, then we have the law of syllogism. Now, the law of syllogism looks very, very similar to the transitive property, which you already know. So if A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then we can claim that A is equal to C. Remember, law of tran the, sorry, law of transitism, uh, the transitive property. So the transitive property allows us to skip over the part in the middle. If we have two things that are equal to the same thing, then they're equal to each other, in other words. So the law of syllogism is the exact same property or same idea, but we're using logic. So instead of them being equal, it's going to be A implies B. So if A implies, oh, I see something that I don't like. Anyway, if A implies B and B implies C, then we can say that A, and it's not going to let me do it. Yeah, it will. Okay, so then we can say that A implies C. There we go. So just like A was equal to C now, which is the logical version, I want to say logical equivalence, but the logical version of the transitive property is the law of syllogism. Pretty simple. All right, so let's do an example. So if it rains, the grass will get wet. And if the grass gets wet, then you can't mow because the grass is wet and it won't cut. It's just going to make a mess, right? So can we make a conclusion? So if it rains, the grass gets wet. And when, we're, when the grass is wet, you can't mow. So we can make our conclusion that if it rains, there we go. oh man, I'm so sorry. The, the color bothers me because <laughs> that was the shade of green I used last year, but now I've updated it. So if it rains, then we conclude that we cannot mow. So just like we were able to up here. So kind of showing it with symbols, and then this is kind of what it looks like in the real world, law of syllogism. All right, so if a language is Spanish, then it is a Romance language. If a, romance, if a language is a Romance language, then it has Latin roots. So what can we conclude? So we can conclude that Spanish has Latin roots, right? Because these two matched up and we went from here to here and then here to here, so we can skip across and go straight over. So if it's Spanish, then it has Latin roots. All right, so that was it. The lecture, about 15 minutes, not too bad. Let's go right into the assignment and I'll try to go through these pretty quick. So if possible, use a law of detachment to make a conclusion. So our premise is if it's a triangle is a right triangle, then it has one right angle. Then they tell us that triangle ABC is a right triangle. So what can we conclude about triangle ABC? 
Well, we said if it has a right triangle, if it is a right triangle, then it has one right angle. So triangle ABC must have, or triangle ABC has one 90 degree angle. All right, number three says if x is greater than seven, then the absolute value of x is also greater than seven. Then they tell us that x is less than seven. Well, notice how those two do not match exactly. So we don't know what happens when x is less than seven. Um, and because that allows it to be a negative number, it could be like negative three, so the absolute value of negative three would not still be, well, it could be negative nine, I guess, would be a counterexample. So it's actually not gonna be true. But don't worry about that, don't even think about that. All you need to look at with the law of detachment is does it match our premise? Our premise tells us that when x is greater than seven, the absolute value is greater than seven as well. So what happens when x is less than seven? We don't know, or at least we can't make a conclusion uh, based on the law of detachment. All right, if cats prowl, then the mice will scatter. Then they tell us that the mice are scattering. So can we conclude that it was the cats that made them scatter? So we gotta be careful here. So we have P implies Q, okay? And then they tell us that Q happens. Can we therefore say that P must have been the cause? No, the reason we can't is because this is not a biconditional statement. If this said cats prowl if and only if mice are scattering, then we could go both directions. But because it's not biconditional, because we don't know that we can go backwards, we cannot, we cannot uh, conclude that if the mice are scattering, that must mean that it was the cats that did the prowling. Okay? It could have been the dog chasing the mice. It could have been me chasing the mice. I've been known to chase mice. <laughs> Occasionally I catch them. There was actually mice that were like living in a brush pile um, down in South Oklahoma. And we started a brush uh, we lit the brush on fire uh, on a good day where there was dew and no wind, right? And uh, he knew there was probably mice living there because they were eating the wires on their trailer, which is really annoying. They actually ate the wires from my grandmother's car and it wouldn't run. And we had to splice the wires and solder them and everything. But anyway, so mice are bad, especially big old rats that eat wires. Anyway, and it came out of the, <laughs> it came out of the fire after it had been smoking in there quite a bit, you know. And it was like all dazed and confused because it was inhaling all that smoke. Smoke is bad for your lungs, by the way, people, in case you didn't know that. Uh, doesn't matter what you inhale, but uh, smoke is bad for you. And uh, so then like the mouse, like it stood up straight and it was like, it looked dizzy, like it was about to fall back over. And then I shot it. <laughs> anyway, moving on. If a triangle has two congruent sides, then the triangle is isosceles. So in triangle DEF, uh, we know that DE is congruent to EF, which means that two sides are congruent. So if triangle DEF has two congruent sides, then what can we conclude? Triangle DEF is isosceles. All right, if possible, use the law of syllogism. So it's like the transit property going from A to B, then B to C, so we can skip from A directly to C. Here's a great example. To take calc, you must first take algebra two. To take algebra two, you must first take algebra one, which means before you take calculus, you must first take algebra one. So again, just the law of syllogism, which same thing as transfer property, just using logic. All right, number 10, a quadrilateral has four congruent sides, if and only if. So notice if and only if allows us to go both directions. Okay, so now we might be able to use the law of detachment even if we start out with something else, okay? So then they tell us a square is a rhombus. Well, what do we know about rhombuses? Uh, because it's allowed to go both directions, a rhombus is a quadrilateral with four congruent sides, because this is a definition, so we can go either direction. So it's reversible. So if a square is a rhombus, and a rhombus has four congruent sides, we can conclude, using the law of syllogism, that a square has four congruent sides. So we are able to go both directions, unlike the last problem I showed you here, because this was not biconditional, we couldn't go backwards with the law of detachment, or the law of syllogism in this case because we were introducing the square. So square goes to rhombus, rhombus goes to four congruent sides, so therefore a square goes to four congruent sides. Law of syllogism. All right, a rectangle is a quad with four congruent angles. A rectangle is also a parallelogram with four congruent angles, and a square is a rectangle. So we can go from square to rectangle, rectangle to quad, okay? Then we can also go from square to rectangle to rectangle to parallelogram, and then both of them have the four congruent angles, so I put that at the end there, anyway. Uh, technically, you could say a square is a quadrilateral with four congruent angles and a parallelogram with four congruent angles, but eh, this was cleaner. All right, also, whenever you're writing these sentences, by the way, you don't have to use complete sentences. So you can abbreviate, you can use symbols, whatever you want to do. You don't have to, um, you don't have to write the full sentences. 
All right, if it is raining, the temperature is greater than 32 degrees. If the temperature is greater than 32 degrees, then it's not freezing outside. So we're going from rain to 32, 32 to not freezing. And then they tell us that it's raining. So in this one, we can actually use the law of detachment because we know it's raining, right? So the first part of our premise is true. And then a chain reaction happens. So what do we know? Okay, so it's raining, so it's not 32. If it's not 32, then it's not freezing. So uh, we know that it's not freezing outside because it's raining, which is interesting. Using both the law of detachment and the law of syllogism. All right, that's it. 20 minutes. Oh my goodness, that is awesome. Yeah, so tomorrow we'll take a practice test. Make sure you guys are caught up on your homework. Um, we will take the test on Tuesday. So all of your chapter two homework is due on Tuesday. Um, and that'll be a good opportunity for you guys to get your grades up. Uh, keep in mind, after that, we've only got, I think, three more weeks um, before we come back from fall break, which will be great. And then we'll take our midterm the first day or the second day. I'll figure it out that you guys come back. And that midterm will replace your test scores. So um, if you didn't know it then, but now you know how to do unit one better, instead of doing a retake, that midterm will act as your retake and it'll bring your grades up. Um, or bring them down if you were cheating and being dishonest about the whole thing. So I'm super excited. It's going to be great. Good for me. Good for you. And we'll get to do other fun activities and finally be able to see each other uh, face to face.